But now, without any further ado, let me introduce you to Anna Eimerling, who is a German journalist who, uh, who, who mostly works for Deutsche Welle, Deutschlandfunk, and also WDR. And particularly when she wears her Deutsche Welle hat, which is the really the equivalent, the German equivalent of the BBC World Service, she is dealing with the Middle East, mostly with a, uh, a program called Fach Focus uh, the Nahost. And um, this would already make her a great speaker anyway, but she's a particularly good speaker for us today because she's just returned from having spent three months in the Middle East, mostly in Oman, but also in Abu Dhabi and uh, in Iran. And she will also shortly return to the Middle East. Um, Anna Eimerling um, was, uh, grew up in Hamburg and then studied at the universities of um, Heidelberg, Munich, Oxford and the Sorbonne. And, after, and while doing that she was already part of a, uh, of, of a um, journalism training program and then quickly started her um, a um, career in journalism. And which, um, which, for instance, was um, merited by the by an, uh, of hard recognition in, um, in in a very prestigious prize that she won in Germany, Axel Springer Prize for Nachwuchsjournalismus, uh, which she won for a piece she did on her coverage of a 2007 um, bombing attack in Beirut. Um, today she will be speaking about her observations from the last three months in uh, the Middle East. She will be talking about autocracy versus democracy, republicanism versus, versus monarchism, the Arab world in 2011 and beyond. And I think also why this talk and an album will be very interesting for us is because I think it will give us a real sense of to see of how also knowledge uh, flows between, um, so like the academic community and journalism, and relate, which is of course because of the goal of the center of pivotal importance anyway, but of course is also important in the context of what's happening in the Middle East, because of course, just like in 1989 or at other events, uh, neither journalists or experts had been predict uh, predicting what was happening. Uh, or let's put it this way, the number of people who after the event that they always knew that this was going to happen is much higher than the number of people who really did say this uh, before. Uh, so I think also in that sense, an and Almond's talk will be uh, very interesting. So please join me in uh, welcoming Anna Almeling to Everdeen. Well, thank you, Tom, and thank you, everybody, for coming. I hope you can actually hear me at the very end. Otherwise, just um, let me know. Um, before I start, I would like to um, say a few sentences about myself. I am um, a freelance journalist, and um, I work, as Tom pointed out, mainly for Deutsche Welle, Germany's international broadcaster, and Deutschlandfunk, Germany's um, public radio, or the main public radio. I studied history, English, and German, so um, until I finished my studies, I wasn't interested in the Middle East at all, whatsoever. So um, basically, what I'm talking about today has more to do with my experience as a journalist rather than with um, what I studied, basically. When I did an internship for the ARD network um, in Cairo in 2004, that was for me the uh, starting point. That was when I got in touch, basically, with the Middle East. And after that, I was employed um, by um, WDR or VDR, which is part of the ARD network. It was only in um, 2008 that I became a freelance journalist, mainly for Deutsche Welle. And um, I'm mainly working for the Middle East program there. During that time, I visited Egypt, um, Israel, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, and Tunisia. And since the Gulf countries seem to become more and more important at the moment, um, I decided about four months ago to go to Oman for half a year altogether and um, see what it's like over there. So I spent the past four months in Oman, but also visited the Emirates, as Tom pointed out, and Iran. And, um, well, I actually brought a map, but since it's very old school, <laughs> but since I'm overwhelmed by the uh, turnout, I would just sort of um, leave it here for a while. It's, um, it, I may refer to it every now and then because I wasn't quite familiar how, um, well, how familiar 
all of you or everybody is with um, the geography of the Middle East, which can be kind of complicated at, the, at times. But um, basically, um, the, the map also points out quite a different perspective in a way, because, um, well, it looks rather different to the maps you normally look at. But anyway, um, this map is, is, maybe we can show it again, it just sort of shows the Arab nation, or what I basically, um, I bought it in Damascus. So um, I found it quite interesting to have a look at the perspective, basically, of the Middle East from a Damascan um, point of view. And talking about the Arab nation, um, if we listen to the news these days, it's kind of easy to get the impression that the whole Arab world is on barricades at the moment. Starting in Tunisia, we all uh, saw that protests have spread to Egypt, Yemen and Libya. There have also been um, demonstrations in Jordan, Bahrain, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait and Morocco. So we also hear about unrest in Algeria, in Lebanon and of course constant difficulties in Iran. So are there any Arab countries that, well, which haven't been affected by this revolutionary wave? Yes, but not very many. Um, we haven't really heard about protests in Mauritania, as far as I know of, not in Syria, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. So the main protests have been taken place in Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen and Libya. And in my um, opinion, this is no coincidence. In fact, on the contrary, because um, these four republics have some similarities they don't share with other Arab countries. Their history and the structure of the states have made them more prone, in my opinion, for the current uprising than, for example, Jordan or Saudi Arabia. I argue that um, republics in the Arab world have been less reform-oriented in the past few decades than, in fact, the monarchies. And they have, in many respects, been less democratic. A few days ago, I read an article um, in The Economist, in this one, about democracy's heart spring. And I would like to quote the last few sentences of this article. The template of a successful Egyptian transition to democracy will prove harder to apply in Arab monarchies. These, so far, have been resistant to change, although pressure is mounting against hereditary rulers from Morocco to Oman and even in Saudi Arabia. I very much disagree with this analysis in fact, I think that the monarchies and the Arab world would have been much more reform-oriented than the republics. I start with Egypt, looking at a few different states, and well, we'll come to the discussion later on. In Egypt, um, in 1952, the monarchy was overthrown and a modern republic was founded in its place but we all know that Egypt was far from being democratic. Officially, they had a constitution, they had a president, they had a parliament, they had several parties and elections. But for the past 20 years, President Hosni Boumbarak ruled with the help of emergency law. There weren't any free elections, there was no individual freedom, there was no freedom of the press. And in fact, the republic was in some respects rather similar to a monarchy because mm -hmm. Hosni Mubarak tried to install his son Gamal Mubarak as his successor. He knew very well that once he would lose power, basically, um, he would um, lose everything. So he tried to stay in power as long as he could. And um, we have already seen a similar case in uh, Syria, for example, when Hafez al-Assad, um, the late Syrian president, died in, died in 2000, his son Bashar became his successor. At that time, there weren't any free elections, and even uh, the constitution had to be changed for Bashar to become president. I think at the age, um, he was like only 36, and but should have been 40 in order to become president, but they, um, they managed. And um, despite the fact that Syria is a republic, we have, again, this dynastical or, well, a dynasty ruler over there. 